Good morning and welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Sunday morning, January the 4th, 2015. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin is entitled, Spiritual Disciplines That Changed My Life. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew chapter 6. If you would, Matthew chapter 6. And I also want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 9. That'll be my introduction scripture, 1 Corinthians 9, and then we'll go into Matthew 6. I will continue my study next week. Uh, the Lord just uh, convicted me uh, while I was gone about this message. I thought about going straight into the Old Testament survey, uh, but He wanted me to talk about a new year. You know, it's a new year, a new beginning. And uh, I think it'd be good to uh, talk about what the Lord has laid on my uh, heart today, and then we'll get into 1 Samuel next week. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is speaking here. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Folks, we are all here for a reason. We are all here for a purpose. And we all need to set goals in our lives. Goals. We need to. If you don't set goals, a lot of times you are just coasting. And, uh, you know, a goal, a general goal is to be a better Christian this year than I was last year. Uh, Wednesday night, I said one of the goals that I have is to sin less, you know, this year than I did. And you can get real specific on goals. And then verse 27, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, least when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. One of the things that God convicted me of uh, about 15 months ago was my weight in my body. And I did have help with this. My doctor looked at me and said, uh, you are a heart attack waiting to happen. I had gotten up to 280 pounds, uh, and it's the largest I'd ever been. And uh, folks, I'm on a salt-free, sugar-free, diabetic diet, and I, I feel better. Uh, but my whole point in all this is I didn't do something about it until I got convicted about it. And folks, I cannot tell people, I cannot sit up here and preach the word and say, because folks, I was addicted to food. It wasn't drugs, it wasn't alcohol, it wasn't cigarettes, but it was just as bad because any addiction is not good in your life. And so God convicted me, and I am not pointing out anybody's weight. My weight is my problem and nobody else's problem, okay? Matter of fact, if you'll look at this coat that I have today, it was a gift that I, I'm telling you, uh, six months ago I couldn't get into it. And God has just allowed me to take what I've learned, because here's what my problem was. I was disciplined in my spiritual walk, but I let that go. The, the thing about my health, and folks, I want to live a long time. I want to live, Lori says I don't snore. Well, I mean, that alone makes my wife blessed, okay? I get up, I have more energy, and I'm just simply saying, Discipline is very important in a Christian's life. Now, I want to share with you three disciplines, and I have not always done these. Okay, I say probably in the last six to eight years, I have gotten where I have figured out I need these three disciplines in my life. And folks, I'm telling you, when I got these disciplines, my life changed. God changed my life. I came here as a young green pastor and I'm just telling you, I really, I thought I knew what I was doing, but I had no clue what I was doing when I first got here. Matter, yeah, Orville, <laughs> appreciate that, Orville. My first 18 months, I just struggled. I shot in the dark. I prayed a lot. And I'll tell you, folks, I hurt. I just, there were times I would leave this service and I would cry all the way home, just hurting. And I finally got this passage, I finally figured out what God was saying to me. He was saying, Mike, you've got to go deeper. you got to go deeper. You've been swimming on top now. you got to go deeper. And folks, I'm telling you, I dove deeper into the Word of God, and I'm sharing with you three spiritual disciplines that changed my life. Number one, and there's an outline in your bulletin if you want to follow along with this. The discipline of giving. The discipline of giving. 
Number two, the discipline of praying. The discipline of praying. And number three, the discipline of fasting. The discipline of fasting. And I will share these three with you. And we'll start in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We'll start in verse 1. And we know historically chapter 6 is an extension of chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. It started with the Beatitudes. And folks, those are attitudes that we need to have. I have preached through the Beatitudes. You have heard the Beatitudes. And these are attitudes that we need to have. And then he comes to chapter 6. And you can see a clear break there, okay? Uh, in chapter 5, towards the end, there's six things. He says, the world says this, but here's what I say unto you. Now, when he changes gears in chapter 6, he has one thing on mind, one thing in mind. And it was those so-called spiritual elites. He was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He was talking about these folks that wore the right clothes, that said the right things that were in the right places, that, that lived their, quote, religion in front of everybody. But folks, our life is not, it's not about religion, folks. It's about righteousness. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about being like Him in everything we do. So when you look at chapter 6 and look at the three things, there's those three things, giving, praying, and fasting, I'm telling you, He says it three times. Twice, he says three things. He says, you need to do that in secret. Okay, when you give, you give in secret. When you pray, you pray in secret. When you fast, you fast in secret. And then he says, do not do any of these things to be seen by man. And folks, that's what the scribes and the Pharisees did. They wanted to appear more holy than everybody else. They had the right garb on. They had the right words. They had the long prayers. And I'll mention that in just a minute. But here, he starts with giving. And let me tell you this, right off the bat, we're not talking about tithing here. This has nothing to do with tithing. Okay? He is speaking of charity giving, which in that day was alms. It is helping the poor or helping the needy. Okay? Every Christian should tithe. I mean, we preach sermons on that. It's in the Word of God. You know that. But here's what I found out. If you don't tithe, then you probably will not give to alms, all right? And I'm not getting on you. I'm simply saying, and you can ask Carla, I have never looked at the tithing records. I could not tell you what anybody gives. I only know, I only know what I give, all right? It's none of my business. It's a private, uh, really, tithing and giving is a form of worship. It is a form of worship. It's giving back to God that which he has given to us. But we're not talking, we're talking about almsgiving. Look at verse 6. Take heed that you do not do charitable deeds before men to be seen by men. And folks, I'm telling you, our motive is so important. Why you do what you do is very important. God looks at your heart. God looks at your motive. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. And I know a lot of times when we speak of giving, we think of money. But folks, it's more than money. It's giving of your talent. I'm so glad I looked up here during our choir uh, Christmas program. That, that choir loft was full. Okay? There's probably still some out there that can sing that ought to be in this choir. Why? Because you bless people with your voice. That's talent. You know what else? We can give our time to God. Our time. Folks, everybody has a say. I do not believe a Christian that says, I'm too busy to go to church. I do not believe a Christian that says, I'm too busy to read my Bible. I do not believe one that says, I'm too busy to pray. Folks, if you're that busy, something needs to change in your life. Every Christian needs these disciplines in their lives. So he's talking about giving here. Now look at verse 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say unto you, they have their reward. When I was a youth minister in my church in Lawton, the pastor asked us to do something that I was very uncomfortable with. And we were in a building program. And he asked the staff to all say how much money we were going to give in the next three years. And I did it because I was obeying my pastor and the one in authority. But I'm telling you, I felt like it was biblically wrong. 
Because you know what? We'll start comparing ourselves to one another. Folks, that's not, the, that's not what he's saying about giving. You give, and you give from your heart. You give and do what the Holy Spirit says, and you don't do it to be seen by men. That's what he's saying, folks. Your motive is so, so important with that. Now look what it says. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Folks, I'm telling you, for, for years I had no idea what that meant. And by the way, it's not South Paul's and writings, okay? It has nothing to do whether you're right or left-handed. You know what it means? It means if you have to think about it, if you hesitate, if you regret what you have just done, you probably did it for the wrong reason. Because folks, people ask me all the time, how do you know who to give and what to give? And folks, there's two things that I use, okay? Two things that I use. How do I know to do charitable giving? I'm not talking about giving to the church. That's a gimme. God asks us to do that. I'm talking about charitable giving, helping someone who is hurting or helping someone in need. Two things I do. Number one, I listen to the Holy Spirit. I listen to the Holy Spirit. Folks, I can honestly tell you there is not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't ask me for money. Not a week, either personally or on Facebook or in emails or in, in something. So I have to discern. I have to listen to the Holy Spirit. And you know what else I have to do? I have to follow my heart. Follow my heart. What is my heart saying? And folks, by the way, when you give money away, you better let it go. You better not expect. When you give it away, you better say, okay, God, I'm giving this to you. What they do with it is their problem, not mine. Folks, I, I honestly, folks, I'm telling you, I've had Christians beat me out. Of, I've had Christians say, I'll pay you back but I never ask for that money again. Folks, that's between them and God. Man, I'm freed up. I did what the Holy Spirit told me to do. And folks, don't qualify. I tell you, I messed up the other day so bad. I say the other day. It's probably been two months ago. I was kind of running late. It was early in the morning. I was going to a hospital, all right? Somebody was having surgery, and I was trying to get there before uh, they, they went back. And man, I get out of my car, and somebody hollers at me. And I looked, and I didn't know the car. I looked in there, and I knew the person. This person had been up to our church several times. We have helped this this person several times. And he said, hey, buddy. And, and I said, yeah. And I don't know his name, but I knew his face. He said, can you give me $20 for gas? And I paused. And I just said, you know what? I'm in a hurry. I can't do that today. And I went on. And I'm telling you, I didn't walk five steps to the Lord just said, man, what are you doing? Are you in that big a hurry? See, I was doing spiritual things, but were you in that big a hurry? And when I turned around, he was driving off, and I, and I did. I prayed for 24 hours. God, if you'll send him back by me, I'll give him some money. You know what? Didn't happen. Why? Because my motive was wrong. Okay? And folks, I am telling you, when you give, you Folks, we are so blessed as a church. We are so blessed as a people. And I never, I promise you, I never not have cash on me. Never. You know why? Because I want to help those who are hurting. I want to be able to dig into my pocket if the Lord tells me to do it. If the Lord, now I don't just, you know, don't be on after church. Hey, preacher, give me 20 bucks, will you? I know you got it. You told us you got it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about helping the hurting and helping the needy. You know what I have? I have a little cash stash. Jonathan, you know where my cash stash is, don't you? You've been in it, haven't you? No, yeah, no, yeah. He has it. And you know what I do? Money from funerals, gifts, anniversaries, stuff like that. I put it in there. And you know what that money's for? It's for needs, just for needs. You know what I found out? I have never run out of money. Ever. Since I started it. Now I've gotten low. Man, I've had 20 to 50 bucks at times. But I mean about the time I run low, God just pours it. Folks, you cannot outgive God. You can't do it. It is impossible. You can't do it. So I'm telling you, the first discipline we need to have in our life and the first discipline He talks about is the art of giving. 
does the Bible not say it is more blessed to give than to receive? And you know what giving does? Giving makes you feel good. Okay? It makes you feel good. And, I, and, and I'm telling you, if it doesn't make you feel good, keep it because you have the wrong attitude anyway. You're wasting your money. It's like when you pray. Remember what the Bible said later on? If you come to the altar and you have something wrong or you have ought, hey, forget it. Don't give. you got the wrong attitude. But I'm telling you, to be so blessed of God and to be able... Folks, I love our food closet. I love, why are we doing the food closet? Because the Bible says the hungry will always be with you. You did an awesome job in December. I asked you to bring three canned goods and you were bringing cases of canned goods, you walk back there right now, our food bank is full. And I'm telling you, God is blessing this church because we are feeding the hungry. And that's what he is saying here. Now look what it says. Your right hand, left hand, that your charitable deed may be in secret and that the Father who sees you in secret will himself reward you openly. Folks, you, can, you cannot. You cannot outgive God. Hold your finger there and go to Luke 6 with me. Luke 6. Luke 6, 38. Give. That's Jesus' word. That is a command. Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You want the windows of heaven to open? Read Malachi 3, folks. Read Malachi 3. The windows of heaven will open. Because people think, when it gets tight, i got to quit giving. Folks, you're doing exactly opposite of what needs to be done. Give it away, and God will meet your needs. Psalm 139. Folks, there's so I'm telling you, as a Christian, you will not have any, you will not be begging for bread. Shaking together, running over, would be put in your bosom, with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I hear people almost compliment themselves by saying, Well, I am a tight wad. I am a tight wad. Well, folks, I don't I, I want to be thrifty. I want to be smart with my money, but I don't want to be a tight wad. If I'm a tight wad, then God's going to be a tight wad with me. That's what that scripture's saying. If I give freely, if I give as a form of worship, if I give because I want to give, if I give because there's a need there, if I give. And folks, I've heard it said in churches, man, we give, we give, we give. Folks, I'm just telling you, you can't outgive God. If there's a need, let's meet that person's need. Number two, not only the discipline of giving, and by the way, Giving is a blessing. It is a blessing. I am telling you, it is a blessing. Two, the discipline of praying. I know what you're thinking. I pray. Oh, really? How often do you pray? How long do you pray? How sincere is your prayer? And here's the one. How effective is your prayers? Folks, can we not say, can we be honest here? Can we not say everyone in here probably needs a little better prayer life? Every one of us. Man, we all pray. I understand that. But I'm talking about effective praying. Look at verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing on the standing in the synagogues and on the corners of streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say you have your reward. I'm telling you, the scribes and the Pharisees at 9 o'clock in the morning, boom, prayer time. They did it outside where everybody would see it. 12 o'clock, prayer time. Outside where everybody, three o'clock, prayer time. Outside where everybody could see it. They prayed more than we do. But folks, just bowing your head and saying some words is not effective praying. Read James, James chapter 5, James 5, 16 through 18 sometime. Verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret place and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Folks, I am telling you, we need to start prayer in our own prayer closets. Our own closets. And folks, the most effective prayers that I have is when I am totally by myself. The most effective. I like prayer meetings. I like our Wednesday night. I like our getting ready for revival prayers. But I talk, I'm talking to you about the most effective. Steve and I prayed last night, and he got up and he went out. And I just stayed there. For some reason, God just told me to stay there. And I just started walking back through the building and praying for Sunday school and praying for church and praying for our teachers. And I got right back in here, and God reminded me, you forgot one thing. 
He said, you prayed for everybody else, but what about yourself? And then you know what I did? I bowed my head and I rededicated my life to Christ right here just hours ago. Why? Because that's what God told me to do. He said, you know what? You did good in 2014, but I'm telling you, you can do better. You can do better. And folks, the most effective prayers we have is not where a bunch of people are. Because see, there are people that pray and think how long you pray is an effective prayer. And I mean, we used to time a guy at my church at Cameron. His name was Brother Jess Lynch. And man, when he, when he closed, no less than five minutes. No less. And my belly's growling. I'm wanting to get out of there. I'm telling you. How long you pray does not mean you pray effectively. Jesus says, just like giving, give and pray from your heart. Do it in secret. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they will be heard for the many words Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Folks, He knows. We're not praying to make Him aware of our needs. He knows what we need. He wants to hear from us. He wants, to, he wants us to trust in Him. We want, he wants us to believe that He can do that. And we need, all of us need to spend more time in sincere, fervent prayer. And in this matter, and in this matter, therefore pray. Now everybody in the world calls this the Lord's Prayer. But folks, I have a little, just a slight problem with the phrase the Lord's Prayer. The Lord used this as a model prayer. It could not have been because Jesus never sinned. He would not have to say, forgive us of our debts. All right? He was perfect. He was saying to the disciples, this is how you pray. This is how you pray. Our Father in heaven, and He is our Father. Hallowed be your name. I'm telling you, His name is above every name. Your kingdom come, and it's coming. Folks, put your seatbelt on. It may be 2015. Your will be done. Here's where we mess up. We pray expecting God to answer our every prayer. You realize it's more important you, that you pray for God's will to be done. When I first got news about my mom, I was on the phone. I was here, and, my, and I would just it just blew me away. We were not ready for it. She said, basically four to six weeks. I started praying right then. I said, God, you got to heal her. You've got to heal God. You are God. I was on my knees praying in my office. And then all at once, you know what He said to me, and it helped me when I talked to mom. Mom said you know what? I'm tired. You know what? I know where I'm going. You know what? I don't want to go through surgery and I sure don't want to go through chemo. It changed my prayer life. So you know what I'm praying now? She'll go quickly and she'll go without pain. Why? Because you know what my will is? I don't want to lose my mom. It's selfish on my part. She's lived 85 years. She's one of the best Christian mothers a guy could have. I would not be in the ministry without my mom. It's like Jesus, man. Jesus was saying, God, if there's any other way, man, I'm not sure about this cross thing. If there's any other way, can we do it? But remember what Jesus said? Not my will, but thine be done. Folks, the reason, one reason our prayers are not being answered is because we're not praying according to His will. We're trying to tell God what we want for our lives instead of saying, okay, God, whatever you do, whatever you do, I'm okay with that. I'm just praying for this family. I'm just praying for this person. I'm just praying for this situation. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is His kingdom. He is powerful. It is for His glory. And you know what we do? When we say amen, we just stop right there. Folks, Jesus is still talking. Jesus is still talking about prayer. Still. Okay, there's no paragraph. All right, there's no pericope there. Okay? Jesus is still talking. What is He saying? Now listen to me. This will change your life. You will be most effective when you can learn to forgive everyone of 
everything they did he experienced. I know there's some big stuff. Big stuff. And I know everybody wants to say, but. But folks, one reason our prayers are not effective is because we have malice and we have hate and we have hurt in our heart that we have never given to God. And here's what I found out. I found out if I pray, I, I even try to pray for that person, I'm not effective if I have an attitude towards that person. But if I will give it all, if I would just give it all to Christ, just give it to Him, I'm telling you, my prayers will be so much more effective. You say, but I can't. Oh, yes, you can. Jesus is inside of you. Think of Jesus' last 72 hours. Think of the trial. Think of the beating. Think of the cross. Think of Him spitting on Him. Think of Him punching Him in the face. But yet He looks at the world. He looks at everyone at the cross and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Folks, I am telling you, if you will learn to forgive, it will change your prayer life. It will change your life. Look what he says. For if you forgive men of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Folks, that's the Word. That's the Word. So if you want effective prayers in your life, Matter of fact, every church that I've been, I've been in staff member three church, I was a youth minister, I was associate pastor, and I've been a pastor here. Every church that I've served in, this has happened. Somebody comes to me and just say, hey, I didn't know you were mad at me. And I said, okay, I didn't either. I said, well, and, and then it's been all kinds of things. It's been, well, you didn't shake my hand, or you don't look me in the eye all the time. Uh, you know, you didn't send me a birthday card was one of them. Uh, and, and I'm looking, and it's happened in all three churches. And I said, both times, and by the way, it's not worth it to hold a grudge. Never. It hurts you more than it hurts them. And here's what I said to these folks in all three churches. I said, God is my witness. I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea. And if I have offended you, I am sorry. I told them that. And they said, well, I really thought you were mad at me. I really thought. And folks, I'm telling you, it's not worth it. I want to be right with God. I want to be right with my family. I want to be right with my fellow man. And you will be so much more effective. Matthew chapter 18. Just look at what the Bible says. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him. Folks, do it. Face to face. Face to face. I mean, you can write a letter if you need to, but I'm just saying the best way is face to face. And him alone. Don't tell anybody else. There's another thing you're supposed to do in secret. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. And that's what I want. Folks, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. I understand you're not going to agree with everything that I do or everything I say. I'm sure you don't think every one of my sermons are just top-notch. I understand that. But I'm saying there's no reason for two Christians to be at odds with one another. Folks, Satan divides, God unites. It's very important. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And when you take somebody, if, if they don't take it well, if you don't get it settled, when you take somebody, you take a friend of theirs. We're not talking about dividing. We're not talking about get somebody on your side who will back you. You take somebody that they believe in you, that you can share with them. I promise you, God is my witness. I meant nothing by what I said. I meant nothing by the actions that I did. Will you forgive me? You need to have that. That needs to come out of your mouth. Then verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him uh, be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. What is the whole purpose in this? What is the whole purpose in what Matthew and, and Jesus is saying? Folks, it's restoration. It's restoration. Folks, we want people right with God, and we as Christians need to be right with one another. That's what he's saying. It's not to kick people out of the church. And I'm not against church discipline. If somebody is just rebellious and they're throwing it in our face and they're being ugly about it, hey, if we need to do that, I will do that. But I'm saying 
the whole purpose is restoration and, and restoring a fallen brother. And that's the way we need to handle. That's God's way. Folks, forgiveness and prayer go hand in hand. Number three, the discipline of giving, the discipline of praying, and the discipline of fasting. Can I say right now, fasting is a lost art. You don't hear sermons on it. You don't know of very many practicing it. And let me give you three books. Uh, I don't have the titles to these books. I think J. Harold Smith is entitled Fasting Your Way to Health. I believe that's his. Uh, Ronnie Floyd has a newer book out. Uh, for you young folks, you'd probably appreciate that more, Ronnie Floyd. And Bailey Smith has a book on fasting, too. Those are ones that I have read and that I would read if I were you. But what is the key to all of this? What did we say the key to giving was? Motive. What is the key to praying? His motive in your heart. What is the key to fasting? Motive. Why are you fasting? Why are you doing this? All right? Let's read the last of these verses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. It'd be like people after church ask me, hey, you want to go out and eat? No, I'm fasting today. Sound like I was pretty proud of that, wasn't I? Folks, I'm just telling you, we shouldn't just figure our face. We shouldn't just say, well, why do you look so bad? I'm hungry. I'm just hungry. If you were fasting, you'd be hungry too. You know, we want to spiritualize things. And folks, fasting is something that you should not tell anybody. And I know people know I fast, but you know why they know I fast? Because I don't eat at certain times. And that's the way it needs to be. Folks, I'm telling you, fasting has changed my life. You know, we work and we work and we work. And the Bible says one day a week we should take off, we should rest. Is that not what the Bible says? And folks, guess what? Our body when we eat, it's working. It's working. Do you know what the scribes and the Pharisees did? They fast two days a week. They fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. But they did it for the wrong reason. In the Old Testament, there was only one reason for a fast. Do you know the Old Testament fast? You know what day it was? The Day of Atonement. Okay, when we got, read the Word, read the Word. It's there. And nobody makes you fast. Fasting is a spiritual discipline. Not to get what you want. Okay? What fasting is, is instead of eating meals, instead of eating meals, you spend that time with God. You spend that time. What you're saying is spiritual food is more important than physical food. And folks, I'm telling you, at one time, I couldn't say that. Physical food, it, it just draws me. I mean, uh, you know, George's and fries and hamburgers and furs. I used to go into Brahms on zero. I walk in the door and the lady at the counter goes, hi, Mr. Franklin, how are you doing? That's how many times I went in there for ice cream. Okay? And I'm just telling you what my addiction was. Fasting is saying, okay, God, in this 24-hour period, I am going to totally focus on you. I say I don't have time. Well, folks, did anybody forget to eat this week? Did you just all day go, all day and think, well, I just forgot to eat. Not one of us did that. We remembered to eat. Folks, we need spiritual food too. And fasting is spiritual food and spending time with God. Look at verse 17. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. You know what he's referring to again? Folks, he's talking about the priest. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the Day of Atonement. You know what he's saying? Get ready for it. Okay? Physically. What did they do? Hey, the priests, before they went into the Holy of Holies, they stripped down and they washed themselves from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. They were supposed to be physically clean, which was, again, a reflection of spiritually clean and no sin. Folks, I'm telling you, when they went into that Holy of Holies, if they had sin in their life, God would kill them on the spot. Read the Old Testament. And I'm saying what you're fasting about, who you're fasting for, and the motive of your fasting is so, so important. Folks, I never make big decisions in my life without fasting. Never. I'm talking house purchases. I'm talking car purchases. I'm talking vocation purpose. You know, I never do anything like that without prayer and fasting. And, and Jesus here is saying this is important. Look at verse 18. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting, 
but your Father who is in the secret place and your Father who is seen in secret will reward you openly. One last scripture about fasting. Matthew 17. Turn over to Matthew 17, our last scripture. And you remember what was going on here. The disciples had been given power to pray, to heal, okay, and to cast out demons. The disciples tried to cast out a demon of a young boy, and it would not happen. And they, they were just scratching their head. They were thinking, why in the world would this not work? And look what Jesus tells them in verse 19. Matthew 17, 19. The disciples came to Jesus privately saying, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because your unbelief, folks, faith, trust, and belief in God. It's not your fasting that does it. It's your faith in God. It's your trust in God. It's just releasing. It's giving it totally to God. God has healing power. For surely I say to you, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. And folks, we're, why, what's the purpose of casting mountains into seeds? It has no purpose. It's saying mentally there is nothing that God cannot do. Nothing. If you will pray, if you will fast, if you will sell out, if you will just give yourself totally to me is what he is saying. Look at verse 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Jesus saw a demon-possessed man. And this guy was crazy. He cut himself. He had chains. He was foaming at the mouth. He was nuts. And God cast the demon out of him. And the Bible says he was setting and he was in his right mind. Folks, there are some situations in life you cannot fix. You can't do it. Other than a mighty move of God, other than the hand of God on your life, it's not going to happen. And folks, when we come up to those places as a Christian, you know what we do? We don't say, I give up. No, folks, I pray more. Why would you walk away from the very person that can help you? Why would you quit praying when prayer, God says prayer is what, the, what it's all about? He says there are some situations in your life that will only get fixed through prayer and through fasting. Folks, when I'm wanting God's will for my life, when I need God's divine will for my life, I'm telling you I'm on my knees, I am praying, and I am fasting. And I'm telling you, He told me every time. I moved three times. Three times I've changed places. And every time, I'm telling you, God has been right in the middle of it. When I left Cameron Baptist Church, I had folks say, you're messing up, dude. You're messing up. When I left First Baptist Church of Alma, I can't believe you're leaving us. I can't believe you're leaving us. Folks, I'm telling you, God told me, clear as a bell, as, as I am talking to you, God told me, you need to go. You need to pastor. Right here at Baptist Church. Folks, how did I know that? Through prayer and through fasting. Let me ask you, what spiritual discipline do you need to work on in 2015? Is it giving? Is it praying? Is it fasting? Maybe it's Bible reading. Maybe it's memorizing Scripture. I don't know what spiritual thing you need, but I'm telling you, every one of us I know needs to work on something. So I'm just praying during this time of invitation, if God speaks to you, would you just come maybe to a prayer altar and just seal it up with God? Just seal it up with God. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, listen to me. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is to become a Christian. To be saved. To turn your heart and your life over to Jesus Christ. Folks, God will change your life. And I pray if there's one here that doesn't know Him, today would be their day of salvation. Father, thank You. Thank You so much for Your Word. Thank You for just pointing them out. God, You just showed us. It's right there in Scripture. So God, if there's anything we need to do, I pray that we will do it during this time of invitation. God, I pray that decisions would be made. Or maybe somebody needs to follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe somebody needs to pray to receive Christ. Maybe somebody needs to join. Lord, You've been talking to them about being a member of this church. 
But God, I pray that they would just listen to the voice of God. Lord, I pray that we would practice these disciplines in our lives. God, it will change your life. It will change your want to. It will change your walk. God, I pray in 2015, we will want to be more like Jesus. God, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Brandon and I will be here. If you have any decision, if we can pray for you, if we can help you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.